was a little bit earlier. I sort of, I, I didn't get quite to the halfway point, so I'll speed through um, some other things. One thing I should mention, which I will, um, for further is when we are looking, or for further talks, I always learn when I give a talk. There's this joke, for any of you who do scientific research, so they say the best way to find a typo uh, for a manuscript is hit the submit button. <laughs> And you go, oh, I can't believe, you know. It, there are always things, you look at it and you don't realize, oh, I've looked at this a million times and now I see something different. So we're always going back to look at what we do to make sure we're getting it right. And the one thing that's also important of these studies, there's something called a p-value. And a p-value is all over the place. What it essentially means, though, is you have to do enough events to get statistical significance. So in a p-value of 0.05, is thought to be the level of statistical significance, which means there's a five in 100 chance that it's not really what you're seeing and it's just chance. And that's the level. Now, if you are doing genome-wide analyses, you see p-values of significance at 10 to the minus eighth, because you are doing so many events that you need to have a ton of events to make sure you've got it correct. So that's just something to be aware of, and I'm gonna show you one more concept before, uh, we'll, and then I'll stop with the statistics. So this is the Myeloma UK um, 11 study. And this is very important in that it's a very large study, it's over 3,000 patients, transplant eligible and ineligible. There's three different induction regimens. I had mentioned that earlier. And then there's the randomization to LEN, LEN plus varinostat. I won't talk about that or no maintenance. What they did show is, we've talked about risk in cytogenetics, is that people with standard risk here, um, high risk and ultra high risk, all had a benefit from LEN maintenance. But you can see that the benefit is not so good with the high risk. So Dr. Reese talked about using more than one drug, two drugs, a PI, a proteasome inhibitor and inhibit to try and control the disease long term because it just, you can see that the curve drops off much more rapidly than in the standard risk. The other thing you need to know, that these, none of these patients had fish. This is all uh, PCR, molecular-based cytogenetic stratification. It's what the British do. Now they've done a, a re retrospective look to show that they seem to be equivalent between the fluorescent site to hybridization CD138 selected uh, analysis versus this molecular PCR. But it is another way of doing things. In fact, our cytogenists are nervous because they're afraid that, oh, I'm going to go out of business. But I don't think they will. But it does point out that you have to really look carefully at the study because sometimes they're doing things a little bit differently. And this is just showing in the patients who got transplanted, those who got LEN versus those who did not had a superior progression-free survival and a superior overall survival. Now this is called a forest plot. It's also called a blobogram. I think forest plot sounds much better because it looks like a tree uh, and that's where it comes from. And this is, remember that hazard ratio? Here's that hazard ratio of one. So anything that falls right on this line means that it's no different between the study arm and the uh, control arm. And these are all hazard ratios that fall to the left, meaning that LEN maintenance is, whoops, keep doing that, is better than no maintenance. And these lines give you, the, usually a reflection of the number of patients in the study. So this Italian study had a relatively small number of patients compared to the French or the American one. And that crosses the line, so that means it's not statistically significant. Whereas here, same thing with the French study, whereas the myeloma UK and the US study are, and this is the aggregate hazard ratio for all four studies. So this is called a meta-analysis. So sometimes you have to do this when you're trying to compare things. I have a few others, I'm not gonna show them. Where you try and look at a whole bunch of studies together because all of these studies were designed as progression-free survival studies. And you need to do this type of study to really show that you have an overall survival benefit where you aggregate them together. This is just showing what's coming down the pike, okay? There's a French study called Cassiope. It's reported at this year's ASH meeting. They're just reporting the induction responses. And I was actually a little disappointed because when you add daratumumab to VTD, uh, bortezomib, thalidomide, dex, you had about an 8% improvement in stringent CR rate, which I would have thought it would have been higher. 
probably because thalidomide's not the drug you'd want to partner with daratumumab. You want to partner lenalidomide. But I didn't design the trial. Nobody talked to me. So, um, and there were probably economic reasons involved because thalidomide's cheaper, and therefore that's what was done in Europe. Um, they won't admit to that, but it's true. Um, and then the, there's a randomization on the back end to DARA versus observation. That's no longer standard observation. I would argue that LEN is, you know, so there's a variety, but then this study was designed before the LEN results were conclusive regarding uh, overall survival. So you, you have these types of things where you're, you know, it's like you're answering yesterday's questions tomorrow because there's a lag between when you get the results out and when you design the study and it makes it complicated. This is a German study that's looking at ELO maintenance. That still hasn't been reported. It just closed recently. This Takeda study looked at exazomib versus nothing, uh, placebo. Uh, and I'll show you the results of that. And this is the study we did here in the U.S. It's using an RVD DARA versus RVD, and then a back end uh, DARA LEN versus LEN maintenance. And that study has only reported just the run in showing that it's safe to do it. And, um, and the, we'll, I'd expect within a couple of years we'll see the results. Now, you'll love this. They want to change the endpoint, which was progression free survival, to MRD negativity. That is, as the primary endpoint. That is very, very invalid thing to do. <laughs> but people will try. So the statistician, our statistician when we had the group meeting was appalled to hear such a thing. But you know why they want to do that? Because they want to report it sooner. Because I bet you dollars to donuts that the MRD negativity is higher in the RVD DARA arm. But what does that mean long term? We don't know. We need to keep it open longer. So there's always this push to get the results out versus um, waiting for the results to mature so we're absolutely sure that we're not seeing some other untoward side effect that may have occurred during the conduct of the study. This is the exazomib study. This is just being reported at ASH. I pulled this off the abstract. And what they showed is that the median progression-free survival is 26.5 months versus 21 months. Remember those numbers. There's ICSA, there's placebo. And so that's a benefit. It definitely does prevent disease progression. But look at the LEN arm. You're not supposed to compare studies. That's also an invalid thing to do, but I'm doing it. Um, 57 versus 28.9 months. That's a big, whoops, that's a big difference. Right away, the placebo arm was superior to the ICSA arm in the other study. You have to look at the patients who are being enrolled in the study. There's going to be a big difference. So that's why they've only reported this as an abstract. So we have to really drill down to see who they are. And then this is the overall survival, which I talked about. This is an update we did a, a, couple, a year and a half ago. So what is on the horizon? This is a lenticular cloud over Chile, which uh, for those of you who do morphology looks like a big red cell. So treating relapsed myeloma, I know everybody's talked a bit about that. I'll go through it very briefly because you can spend three hours going over all the options. There's commercial and protocol therapies. Commercial means it's, or FDA approved, it's not on a study. Protocol means it's on a study because it hasn't been approved yet for use. Most options are combination therapies, some are not. Previous therapies can be retried. retried. Dr. Reese talked about that, that you can just add something, or if you've been off something for a while, you can go back to it. It's not like lung cancer, not like lymphoma, where once you've seen something, you don't go back. And therapies continue to be developed for myeloma. And why? Because myeloma is still not a curable disease. And to be quite frank, pharma will continue to develop drugs. Once it's cured, you don't need any new drugs because it's curable. And so that's why it's an interesting dilemma that we face uh, in terms of drug development. This is aloe transplant for myeloma. And I, was, and I can just say in one word, should aloe transplant be considered standard of care for multiple myeloma? No. Okay? And it's not even clear if it should be used at all. We occasionally do it, but um, it's still not anywhere near a standard. And this is a, a cautionary tale. This is a study that was going to use Flumel with bortezomib uh, as GVHD prophylaxis and part of the uh, therapy. GVHD is a complication of allo transplant. And what they did was they took a bortezomib-based regimen to prevent this complication 
with a different regimen, FluBU, and melded it with FluMel, which is used uh, in some cases to treat, well, Mel for the auto, and FluMel for an aloe from another person. And then they were going to randomize patients on the back end to exazomib versus placebo to see if it would prevent disease recurrence. Now, aloe for tra transplant for myeloma is really for somebody who's very young, very high risk disease, uh, because it has a lot of toxicity associated with it. Well, when they combined these two together, they got an unexpected toxicity. They had terrible neurologic toxicity, and they had to close the study. And it's a cautionary tale in that they should have done a run-in to test feasibility. They did not. I'm on the study committee, and I was sort of like, I don't know if we should do this, but I got outvoted. Um, I can be Cassandra. So this is the study, and it was enrolling here until they put it on hold to due to this, all this terrible neurotoxicity. Then they re, um, reopened it, but look at the enrollment. This was projected, and this is actual, and they had hoped to get this enrollment after because you can see the study had been put on hold. But they closed it here, and the reason why they closed it was poor accrual. And why did they close it? Well, one, the toxicity. Two, the criteria for enrollment are very narrow. And three, there are CAR T cells. And people are much more interested now. You probably have heard of CAR T cells. I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, and that's why cautionary tale about studies. You have to really think ahead when you design them, because otherwise you can end up with a study that just doesn't work. There were untoward toxicities. It wasn't done properly. And this was done in a cooperative group setting. And yet there were painful mistakes made. So I, I think this is from Dr. Kyle. Dr. Kurtz has seen this slide a million times. And I got it from David Wiesel. And this is why also we do studies. And it, you know, we talked about earlier about some dark humor. Well, this is dark humor. But it's important that we do this because we need to learn. And sometimes you laugh about what we did. But at the time, it probably wasn't very funny. Because urethane was thought to be the treatment for multiple my myeloma back in the early 60s. I mean, it's kind of this toxic thing sort of like the lining of cans and things. Um, but they wanted to see whether or not this would work. And so they gave patients urethane versus a placebo for both primary therapy and relapse therapy. There really was no good therapy. Melphalan was really about it. And because urethane, I guess, must taste horrible, I have not tasted it knowingly, they put it in a Coca-Cola flavored syrup. And the placebo essentially was Coca-Cola, versus Coca-Cola and urethane. And which arm do you think was better? Coca-Cola. So this is the Coca-Cola arm on the top, and that's the urethane arm on the bottom. Whoops. This is why we do randomized studies, because sometimes we think we know what the best is, and we comp are completely wrong. i give you a long story about transplant for breast cancer. It's a long, sordid tale but that turns out to be no better than chemotherapy. So this is, again, people say, I don't want to be a guinea pig. I don't want to be experimented on. This is why we do studies, because I don't want to be doing the same thing 10 years from now that I'm doing today. And this is how we learn. So it's, it's always you know, a, a balance in terms of what we do, but it's really important until we have something that's curable that we continue to do clinical studies. So that's my pitch for that. I'll stop. Now, this is the future with regards to immunotherapy. And I'm not going to go over each of them because it's too complicated. And this is acute myeloid leukemia, but all of these things have the same applicability to multiple myeloma. And that's why we need to be thinking about them for future studies and future ways to treat. It's very exciting. It's just that we, it's one of those hurry up and waits because we need to get them out into, into trials, but you have to wait and get them done. And I'll show you why. Now, this is a study called Keynote, and there was some great data when you combine checkpoint inhibition, which is a way to modulate the immune system, with uh, an IMIT, usually pomalidomide or lenalidomide. And the phase two data looked fabulous, like this was going to really make a huge impact on multiple myeloma. And this is the randomized, style in pe randomized trial in people who had had prior, who had relapsed disease and it came back. This is the arm with pomalidomide and dex alone. This is the arm with pomalidomide, dex, and pembrolizumab. There is an inferior overall survival to the combination of the three drugs. Would 
was not seen, not really observed in the phase two study, hard to say. And this is the progression for survival. You thought, well, maybe they died sooner, but there was a subset of patients who benefit. No, nobody did. And then even worse, when they went up front, so these are transplant ineligible who got Lendex versus Lendex uh, pembrolizumab. Here's the overall survival. The Lendex patients lived longer than the patients who had the three drugs. Again, this is why we do phase three studies and we do them randomized so that we make sure that we're doing the right thing for our patients. Because again, if we had based it on all the phase two data, we'd be using this and we wouldn't be realizing we were actually harming patients. This is the progression free survival, no benefit. I could go half an hour as to why this occurred, et cetera, but I won't go into it. But again, cautionary tale. This is again why we do studies. So this is CAR T cell therapy. This is the fun part because it's really interesting. For those of baseball fans here, you know baseball? Okay. CAR T cells are not a home run. Home run means everybody's cured, okay? But they are probably somewhere between a double triple, maybe sometimes a single, but it is an advance forward, and I'll go over <coughs> some of this. What it involves is taking a patient's own white cells in the laboratory, putting in an antibody, uh, it's a receptor that will bind to the tumor, uh, kill it, uh, sorry, then grow it, it gets in, grows up into the cells, and then those cells which have this new receptor in it now can attack the patient's cancer. So this is what it looks like. It's essentially taking, it's a mouse antibody. I love this. And what's really cool is Janssen has one, which is a llama antibody. Llama antibodies look a little different than human and mouse ones. So it's called a camelid, I guess, because llama and camels have very similar antibodies. So Janssen's, B, it's, and it's against something called BCMA, which is B-cell maturation antigen. I know at least one of you in here has had this. And, um, it is very, very interesting how it attacks and kills the tumor, and I'll show you that in a sec. So here we have a T cell. This is a, right now it's done by taking the patient's own T cell. And then what happens is they are infected with a virus. Now the thing is this virus is a disabled HIV. And when you hear Carl June talk about this at Penn, he has this big grin on his face. He says, yeah, it's HIV, but it's just disabled. It's not gonna cause HIV, but this virus goes into T cells, and that's what you want this, uh, this uh, construct to do. So it goes into the T cell, and now it expresses this, in this case it's CD19, but it could, which is a B cell marker, it could be BCMA, which is a multiple myeloma marker, and it sees that antigen, binds the cell, and kills it. So that's known as CAR T cell treatment. You may have read about this. Emma was the first young lady who got this. It was in the New York Times last summer. And she was six years old and dying of acute lymphoblastic leukemia and got this. And she's now 14 and she's doing fine. So it works very well in ALL, pediatric ALL. We're now trying to move it into adult ALL. It works well in um, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, not for everyone. There are patients who still relapse, and it's now being trialed in multiple myeloma. We have it open here, and I know it's open at many other sites around the country because it's very interesting, and it seems to work. In this case, patients receive what is called a conditioning regimen or lymphodepleting regimen with therapy to knock down their lymphocytes to allow this new lymphocyte to come in that's been sort of like a Franken cell, which has gone in, is gonna go around and attack your cancer and then uh, you monitor them over time. This, is a, this has been presented, this is the Chinese version, this is the, the llama one. Uh, it was mouse originally, now it's llama. This is one from Bluebird, um, which is a company that's partnered with Celgene to do this. And here's somebody whose marrow was loaded with uh, BCMA, which is expressing cells, those are the myeloma cells. They then got four weeks after the treatment a complete wipeout of the marrow and then about eight weeks later, all the good cells grew back and there were very few BCMA because it was now gone. 
Now this is not for upfront therapy. You saw what happened with pembrolizumab. We don't know if somebody who's got a in, more intact immune system is gonna have more problems with this. Thus, we need to study it. So it's being primarily tried in patients who are heavily pretreated, have had four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines, lines of therapy before they get this, and there is efficacy. So this will likely get a label next year. It'll be FDA approved, my guess, end of next year, beginning of 2020. Then we're gonna to have to figure out where do we partner, push that into the algorithm of therapy. It's a good problem to have. So lastly, this is, uh, I call this is a real Franken cell, where what these people did, uh, this company Selectus, is they knocked, they knocked in a marker to track their T cell. This they took anybody's T cell, anybody who's got normal T cell function. Then what they did is they put in a marker so they could kill it off. This is CD20, so they could give an anti-CD20 antibody called rituximab if they thought it was acting up too much. Then what they did, they didn't use CRISPR, which is the new hot topic to delete genes. They used something called Talin. So they knocked out the T cell receptor so this would no longer be what we call alloreactive. So you could put it into anybody, and they knocked out CD52 so they could use a drug called Campath to use for lymphodepletion. And now you have this cell that you could pull out of the freezer and put into anybody. That's what's very interesting. You don't have to do that individual manufacturing anymore. Of course, the first patient they did it on in an acute myeloid leukemia trial died. And then um, the first child they did it on they wiped out the leukemia, but they also wiped out all her bone marrow, and they had to do a bone marrow transplant. That's okay. I mean, she was dying of her leukemia. It was worth the risk. But we have to balance risk and benefit, and we have to really monitor these patients very carefully because you don't know what will happen. So I am going to, um, this is just my end point of there's a variety of strategies for long-term control of disease. I've touched on them. Bortezomib's been used. Exasmum now can be at least thought about. Again, the idea of using a doublet makes more sense for very high-risk patients, but it's not proven proven. We're trying to test out new approaches to figure out what best to use, and this is just a laundry list of all the things that are, that are being targeted. BCMA is the hot topic right now. There are BCMA antibodies that grab the uh, BCMA and they've got a poison on it, so they go, it's like a Trojan horse again. They get into cell and kill it. There's one where they bring the two cells together, the T cell and the tumor cell, and the T cell kills. So there's a variety of new approaches that we are just beginning to understand how we approach this. We also need to develop early endpoints. I pointed out that if somebody lives a very long time, we have to keep the study open a very long time so that we know what to do. So I'd like to end with this. This is my, now we're going to do Roman history. Carthage was the sworn enemy of Rome. And Cato the Elder used to end all his speeches. It could be a speech on grain subsidies, sewer, sub, you know, sewer replacement. He would always end every speech with Carthago Delenda S. Carthage must be destroyed. And in an era where median progression-free survival it's approaching five years and overall survival 10 years. We must have early endpoints for outcome. Otherwise, we will have to keep studies open way too long. So I always end my talks now with that. I'm beginning to, I don't want, I'm not saying I'm Cato the Elder, but we must do this. And I think it's very important. And thus trial participation is incredibly important so that we can understand what we're doing today and help our patients tomorrow, just as somebody 10 years ago participated in a trial and helped you. And I will uh, end with, these are all the people. We have a huge team involved with taking care of our patients. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge all my colleagues around the world and in the U.S. who participated in all these studies. I'd like to give a shout out to two people in particular. Dan Sargent, who Maury knows very well, was head of the Stat Center at Mayo Clinic. He died very tragically two years ago and really had a lot to do with the analysis for the lenalidomide maintenance studies. He's a really great guy. And Jim O'Mell, who's the patient advocate for the Alliance, he was on the Myeloma Steering Committee. He has multiple myeloma and he's lived with it for many years. He's always very thoughtful as a patient advocate, and he also happens to be a physician. 
And Jim has really had a lot to do with a lot of these studies being developed. And I always like to give him a shout out because patient advocacy means a lot to us as we're trying to develop trials and, and then analyze them later. And my, my colleagues at NCI, my colleagues at Roslyn, my, whoops, and my wife who has to put up with me. And then I'd like to thank you very much. This is a neutrophil. Those of you who have the consent forms just now, if you could just drop.